29. On the Critical Condition of Marcellinus Greetings from Seneca to his friend Lucilius. You have been inquiring about our friend Marcellinus, and you desire to know how he is getting along. He seldom comes to see me, for no other reason than that he is afraid to hear the truth, and at present he is removed from my danger of hearing it, for one must not talk to a man unless he is willing to listen. That is why it is often doubted whether Diogenes and the other cynics, who employed an undiscriminating freedom of speech and offered advice to any who came in their way, ought to have pursued such a plan. For what if one should chide the deaf, or those who are speechless from birth, or by illness? But, you answer, why should I spare words? They cost nothing. I cannot know whether I shall help the man to whom I give advice, but I know well that I shall help someone if I advise many. I must scatter this advice by the handful. It is impossible that one who tries often should not sometimes succeed. This very thing, my dear Lucilius, is, I believe, exactly what a great soul man ought not to do. His influence is weakened. It has too little effect upon those whom it might have set right, had it not grown so stale. The archer ought not to hit the mark only sometimes. He ought to miss only sometimes. That which takes effect by chance is not an art. Now wisdom is an art. It should have a definite aim, choosing only those who will make progress, but withdrawing from those whom it has come to regard as hopeless. Yet not abandoning them too soon, and just when the case is becoming hopeless, trying drastic remedies. As to our friend Marcellinus, I have not yet lost hope. He can still be saved, but the helping hand must be offered soon. There is indeed danger that he may pull his helper down, for there is in him a native character of great vigour, though it is already inclining to wickedness. Nevertheless, I shall brave this danger, and be bold enough to show him his faults. He will act in his usual way. He will have recourse to his wit, the wit that can call forth smiles, even from mourners. He will turn the jest first against himself, then against me. He will forestall every word which I am about to utter. He will quiz our philosophic systems. He will accuse philosophers of accepting dolls, keeping mistresses and indulging their appetites. He will point out to me one philosopher who has been caught in adultery, another who haunts the cafes, and another who appears at court. He will bring to my notice Aristo, the philosopher of Marcus Lepidus, who used to hold discussions in his carriage, for that was the time which he had taken for editing his researches, so that Scorus said of him, when asked to what school he belonged, at any rate he is not one of the walking philosophers. Julius Graysonus, too, a man of distinction, when asked for an opinion on the same point, replied, I cannot tell you, for I don't know what he does when dismounted, as if the query referred to a chariot gladiator. It is mountbacks of that sort, for whom it would be more credible to have left philosophy alone than to traffic in her, whom Marcellinus will throw in my teeth. But I have decided to put up with taunts. He may stir my laughter, but I perchance shall stir him to tears. Or, if he persists in his jokes, I shall rejoice, so to speak, in the midst of sorrow, because he is blessed with such a merry sort of lunacy. But that kind of merriment does not last long. Observe such men, and you will note that within a short space of time they laugh to excess and rage to excess. It is my plan to approach him, and to show him how much greater was his worth when many thought it less. Even though I shall not root out his faults, I shall put a check upon them. They will not cease, but they will stop for a time, and perhaps they will even cease if they get the habit of stopping. This is a thing not to be despised, since to men who are seriously stricken, the blessing of relief is a substitute for health. So while I prepare myself to deal with Marcellinus, do you in the meantime, who are able, and who understand whence and whither you have made your way, and who, for that reason, have an inkling of the distance yet to go, regulate your character, rouse your courage, and stand firm in the face of things which have terrified you. Do not count the number of those who inspire fear in you, 
Would you not regard as foolish one who was afraid of a multitude in a place where only one at a time could pass? Just so, there are not many who have access to slay you, though there are many who threaten you with death. Nature has ordered it that, as only one has given you life, so only one will take it away. If you had any shame, you would have let me off from paying the last instalment. Still, I shall not be niggardly either, but shall discharge my debts to the last penny, and force upon you what I still owe. I have never wished to cater to the crowd, for what I know they do not approve, and what they approve I do not know. Who said this? you ask, as if you were ignorant whom I am pressing into service. It is Epicurus. But this same watchword rings in your ears from every sect, peripatetic, academic, stoic, cynic. For who that is pleased by virtue can please the crowd. It takes trickery to win popular approval, and you must needs make yourself like unto them. They will withhold their approval if they do not recognise you as one of themselves. However, what you think of yourself is much more to the point than what others think of you. The favour of ignoble men can be won only by ignoble means. What benefit, then, will that vaunted philosophy confer, whose praises we sing, and which, we are told, is to be preferred to every art and every possession? Assuredly, it will make you prefer to please yourself rather than the populace. It will make you weigh and not merely count men's judgments. It will make you live without fear of gods or men. It will make you either overcome evils or end them. Otherwise, if I see you applauded by popular acclamation, if your entrance upon the scene is greeted by a roar of cheering and clapping, marks of distinction meet only for actors, if the whole state, even women and children, sing your praises, how can I help pitying you? For I know what pathway leads to such popularity. Farewell.